Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dean Adrian Catherine Wing, and I'm the director of the UI Center for Human Rights. I am also the Bessie Dutton Murray Distinguished Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law Programs at the College of Law. Our sponsors today include UICHR, the Black Law Student Association, and the Law School DEI Committee. Founded in 1999, UICHR is involved in programming that reaches the campus, the city, the state, the nation, and beyond. Since the pandemic, we have held over 100 virtual events with over 8,000 viewers. It is my pleasure to introduce today's program for Black History Month. We are showing a special virtual screening of the award-winning documentary short, Becoming Black Lawyers. This film is 25 minutes long. It has received official selections to screen in over 70 film festivals, and it has won 20 national and international awards so far, including many best documentary short recognitions. It's also received an Audience Choice Award at the Topaz Film Festival presented by Women in Film in Dallas and top honors for Jury's Choice, Best Documentary Short from the Montreal International Black Film Festival, the only American film to receive an award there. During Black History Month, this film has been screened through private events hosted by Black Law Student Association chapters at over 80 law schools in the United States. And there are many more invitations to screen it at law schools in the United Kingdom and Australia. This film will be followed by a Q&A with the filmmaker, Evangeline M. Mitchell, an Iowa Law alum. So I will give you her bio now and you will see her after uh, the film is done. She was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and raised in Houston. She graduated from Prairie View University, magna cum laude, and then attended and graduated from Iowa Law. While at Iowa, she served as a member of the Iowa Law Review, the Black Law Student Association, and the Phi Alpha Delta, where she chaired the Law-Related Education Committee. She participated in the France Study Abroad Program and the London Law Program as well. She went on to earn a master's degree of education from Harvard, concentrating in administration, planning, and social policy. Evangeline is currently a lawyer, author, publisher, documentary filmmaker, social entrepreneur, and nonprofit founder. She has been recognized throughout the years for her grassroots trailblazing advocacy work on behalf of aspiring black lawyers. This work includes writing, editing, and publishing books to help demystify law school and the process of becoming a lawyer. Her books include African American Law School Survival Guide, Profiles and Essays of Successful African American Law School Applicants, Conquering the Bar Exam, and Lessons from Successful African American Lawyers. Additionally, she has founded and produced major national empowerment events. The most popular for the past 17 years is the National Black Pre-Law Conference. And for the last eight years, she's also produced the National HBCU Pre-Law Summit. Since last year, She's created and executed Future Legal Eagles Flight School for Black youth and parents. Most impressively, Evangeline has been adamant about contributing these invaluable resources at no cost to the aspiring lawyers who benefit. Throughout the years, she has empowered literally thousands of prospective Black law students across the country by providing information, resources, and connections that many would not otherwise have access to. She is the recipient of several awards for her groundbreaking work, including most recently in 2021, she received the Clio Edge Award 
in education from the Council of Legal Education Opportunity. She has been selected as among the top 100 national black lawyers and was named as one of the top 10 most influential black lawyers of the decade by lawyers of color because of her incredible impact of her targeted pre-law initiatives and efforts to increase the number of excellent strategic and competitive black law student applicants, law students, and lawyers. As I said, you're going to meet her after this film. I will do an interview with her and there will be a QA. and a and, and you can put your questions into the Q&A and we would please for time's sake, put questions uh, that relate to the film uh, and not about more broader issues. So with that, uh, we're gonna go see the film now and be back in about 25 minutes to have questions. That was just tremendous. Thank you so much, uh, Evangeline, for doing this important work. Uh, it will now be my pleasure to uh, ask you some questions uh, about the documentary. And um, so I wanna say before I start asking those questions or let everybody know, Evangeline was my student when she was at the College of Law. I always knew she was gonna be a superstar and she is. And if you have uh, the audience, if you, you have any questions for her, please put them in the uh, Q&A. And as I said, before the film began, please make your questions about the documentary. So uh, Evangeline, I, I knew you were gonna be a superstar, but I, I had no idea you were gonna get into documentary filmmaking. So what is it that, that made you decide to create uh, this film? That's a wing. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for inviting me and allowing me to share um, the documentary with the University of Iowa um, and the, the, the law school community and the, the entire university community. Um, I actually had the uh, idea to do the documentary while I was still a first year student. And I wanted to do a book, I wanted to do a documentary, and all of it was because of the experience that I had. Um, I came from a predominantly, I went to a predominantly Black high school, an HBCU, a historically Black college. Um, I was very excited about going to law school, but I was very limited in terms of, at that time, there wasn't a lot of information out there the way it is now. So. I came in with kind of this social justice perspective, thinking that it was gonna be, instead of law school, maybe justice school or social justice school. So I came in with this per, a very different perspective than what I was facing. And um, I knew it was gonna be hard. I knew it was gonna be academically rigorous and challenging. And so that was one part of it, but I had no idea um, that race would play you know, as big of a role that it did in my law school experience. And it wasn't just Iowa because I attended law school. I did the France program. I studied in London. I was a visiting student. And throughout the years, I've spoken to students all over the country. So really a lot of the issues that black students face are very national, even global. So it's not just an Iowa thing, but my experiences um, made me feel like I needed to do something um, to share our stories, and I needed to do something to share with people the fact that our experiences, we had additional challenges that our experiences are, uh, for many of us are different. And my main motivation is I spend so much uh, time and emotional energy trying to make it make sense and trying to process what I was experiencing. And that was time and mental and emotional energy that I could have spent you know, more of that time focusing on my academics, but I was just trying to understand kind of the racial dynamics. It just, I just couldn't understand any of it. And so um, my motivation in, in, in wanting to do the documentary and a lot of the work that I've been doing is I want to encourage black students and let them know that these are issues that they're gonna face so that they can be armored, so that they can be ready and so that they can just focus on what they're there for, focus on their why and stay the course and not waste a lot of the time and energy a lot of us before them had to because we didn't really quite know what to expect coming in. It was so moving. Um, 
I graduated law school in 1982. And everything that, you know, uh, all of uh, the participants in the film talked about existed when I was in school. And, and of course, that was very depressing to know that despite so many decades going by, our students are still facing these things. And so I, I was really moved just, just listening to, to what they had experienced. Now, going back to making this uh, documentary, what was the hardest part uh, about, about doing it? I would say um, the most challenging part in terms of getting it done is I made the decision um, to complete it during the pandemic. Um, I think what was challenging is that as, as you can see, whenever you read the credits of any film, um, this is not a solo effort. It's very much a team effort. You need a lot of people playing their roles to make it happen. And so for me, I had to find editors and sound people and people to do all kinds of things. And I had to do it remotely. So, you know, I couldn't just find people who were local. I, I ended up, you know, my team is truly diverse. I have people literally from all over the world who contributed to getting this completed. So I think um, just kind of getting comfortable with, okay, I'm getting, I have to get it done. Let me try to find the best people I can and see how well we can work together and get it done remotely. So I think that was the most challenging part. Um, yeah, doing it that way and not having people in front of me, but people from all over and trying to um, explain the vision and make sure we were on the same page and just work towards executing and getting that vision, um, you know, on film, so. Well, it was amazing that, you know, you could do this in a pandemic at all. Uh, many experienced filmmakers, you know, TV shows, everything, you know, couldn't uh, function as, as they normally would. Now, why did you make it a short as opposed to a full length documentary? That's a great question. I'm, my, my vision was to do kind of more of a series, but even in that series, I wanted every episode to at least be about an hour or more. So um, actually there's um, another documentary filmmaker who is kind of a, um, a mentor to me. And we were talking about the footage and you know what I could and couldn't get done during this pandemic. And one of the things that he, um, he mentioned to me was um, the fact that I had enough to make a short. And then, you know, I've been taking documentary uh, filmmaking classes and I, you know, conferred with my professor about it. And she said, well, if you do a short, it really needs to be about 20 minutes. And so at first I'm thinking 40, 20, but in any event, I decided to do a short because I wanted to get something done. So I felt with, I had all this stuff in my head and I felt if I was going to get something done, then, you know, getting it down to around 20 minutes, that was doable. So the decision was really, uh, one, I wanted to get something out there into the world. And then two, another factor about shorts is that the chances of people actually watching uh, the film increase dramatically. Um, if you do a short as opposed to a feature length, which is usually about an hour and a half. So 20 minutes versus an hour and a half. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense because uh, people can complete that. They, they can watch it. If you're asking a person to devote an hour and a half of their time, the chances of reaching more people are kind of lessened. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you pick uh, the lawyers that you featured and why were there more women than men featured? Yeah, and that's a really good question. I, it, it, to be honest with you, it, the, the people who are in the film, in a lot of ways, it's kind of random. Um, I, the original plan was to go all over the country and interview people all over the country. What you see on this short are people who showed up to the, to the interviews for New York City. Um, the plan was to go to New York and all these just different places. This particular day of filming, these are just the people who happen to show up. Um, there were a total on this day of filming of six people. Five of them were, were women. <laughs> Only one was a, uh, a male lawyer. And then one of them I did not include in this because she attended um, an HBCU. And so that's an entirely different experience. So I didn't want to include it in this particular film. But um, there was no, of course, you know, I would have wanted it to be a balance between men and women, 
But because um, I decided to use what I had from that day of shooting, it just happened to be more, um, more women that showed up on that day. And that's really the only reason. I would have liked it to be more balanced, but that's just kind of how it worked out. Yes. Um, how did you get the training to produce and direct uh, this, this documentary? I, I, I think you alluded to you, you had an instructor uh, in this. Yes. Um, in 2017, I made the decision to go ahead, no matter what it took, to get this done. Because as I mentioned, I've been wanting to do a documentary on this subject matter since I was a law student so many years ago. And so um, 2017, I made the decision, okay, I'm, I'm going to start filming. I'm going to get everything together. I'm going to start posting on social media to find people. And um, I enrolled in a certificate program with the Center of Documentary Studies at Duke University. So starting in 2018, I've been taking courses. I'm still taking them now. I'm still not done. So I'm set to graduate uh, from the program this, uh, this hopefully by the, by the uh, fall, by the end of the fall, or maybe by the spring. But um, that's, that's, that's helped tremendously because at least I have people who are also really interested in documentaries to kind of go back and forth with. And so um, that, that's been a lot of, that's been very helpful in this whole process. So it's been that and just kind of getting on social media, trying to connect with other people who are um, doing documentaries and it's kind of been self-taught, which is a great thing because the entire, um, you know, legal education experience, you're learning to teach yourself things. So. Um, you know, by having that experience early, I was not intimidated at all by the idea of doing the, the documentary because I've been able to go out and, and kind of like figure it out as I go and talk to people and just, just get it, get to work. So that, but that program, the documentary studies that pro, uh, program at Duke has been very helpful. Wow. Um, now I want to focus on the messages that you're trying to get across. What are, what are the messages you're trying to get across to, you know, Black pre-law students, to Black lawyers, but broader than that, what are the messages you're trying to get across to people who aren't Black or who aren't lawyers? Right. Um, I think the main message that I'm hoping to get across to um, Black law students and Black pre-law students is uh, the reality that, you know, they are, you are going to face additional challenges. It's not in your head. These are things that we all face, but it's very, very important to stay the course. And I think um, when you don't know that there are other people who've gone through similar things and you're not quite, I think that's where you start losing people because you're going through this, it's, it's a lot. And, you know, just, hearing the stories of other people and knowing that they experienced very similar issues, but they remember why they were going to law school. And they remember that, you know, given the historical context of all of the fighting that black people have had to go through and the, the special relationship that we have to the law um, from the way the law was used to, you know, enslave us, to subjugate us, to control and segregate, but also the power of the law um, to free us and to give us uh, rights, you know, and citizenship. And then, you know, from second class citizenship to first class citizenship. So the law is so significant. And so what I'm hoping is that, you know, the aspiring lawyers understand it's really, you know, like Marcus stated, it's not about you. It's, it's, it's really more of, you know, knowing that historical context and the fact that the fight can, and the struggle continues even when you make gains. It's a continual process and the next generation has to fight and the next generation. So just understanding that, you know, they are needed, that the struggles that, that you know, we faced or, you know, those struggles we're gonna continue to face, but just to stay the course. So that's for the black aspiring lawyers. For everyone else, um, I think the, the message is more of a message of empathy um, it's very important to be able to understand that you can be in the exact same law school, the exact same classroom, walk the exact same halls, and there are other people who are going to have very different experiences than you. 
and the fact that race continues to make a difference in the everyday lives of Black people, that we continue to have struggles and challenges, and then to kind of maybe open their eyes, uh, other people's eyes to it so that they can understand that, um, you know, that it wasn't over, you know, that things, you know, are not, you know, continue to not be on equal footing and that there are additional, like we have to really be extremely resilient every single day and be ready to just uh, fight and, and look past and deal with a lot of different things. So for us, keep going. For everyone else, um, it's important to have empathy and understand that, you know, other people have different experiences and especially um, I think as lawyers, that's incredibly important. I cannot imagine uh, what world we're in if you know lawyers are supposed to be seeking the ideals of justice and fairness and liberty, and we we're not taking the time to try to you know put ourselves in other people's shoes and understand um, their ex perspectives and their their experiences. Thank you. I could go on another hour with my questions, but we have questions in the. Uh, chat uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and so I want to go to some of those. Um, do you have plans for other documentaries? And if so, what will those focus on? Yes, I actually do. I, I'm, I've, I was so intrigued. And in, as I've talked to students who attend um, HBCU law schools, how dramatically different their experiences uh, have been as compared to um, the experiences I was in, and like I stated, I was in four different uh, law school environments um, during my law school years, um, you know, study abroad here, and then also I visited for a semester a law school, um, you know, in my city, my hometown. But um, I, I want to do something on HBCUs. I want to do more work um, on, on um, capturing and documenting the stories of um, Black lawyers. Um, reflecting on their experiences. I have a Black Lawyers Legacy Project um, that I'm doing, which is also a doc documentary series, as well as um, lots of oral histories that I wanna capture, because I think it's very important um, to document um, these experiences. Um, so those are the main things to continue with this project, the HBCU Law Schools, and then also um, the Black Lawyers Legacy Project, where I can document the experiences of um, especially the elder and the trailblazing um, black lawyers. I really wanted to get that, you know, while people are still here with us. Thank you. Uh, another question is, the music is wonderful. How did you find it? The music um, in the documentary is actually um, music that um, I produced. So I wrote, um, the song in the beginning, I wrote um, the song at the end and I collaborated with a professional vocalist and told her with harmonies what I wanted and things like that. My main reason is I didn't wanna have to fight, you know, or struggle with trying to purchase um, licenses because when you put together documentaries, you know, you have to pay for licenses for everything. And so um, I couldn't quite find the music that I wanted. so. And, and uh, this is a documentary that I did on a tiny budget. So I said, you know what? I can't find what I'm looking for. I can't, probably can't afford to pay for what I'm looking for. So I need to go ahead and create it. So um, I wrote the lyrics and the melodies and handed it to someone who is a professional who knew, um, who knew what they were doing, so. You have screened this film in the UK. You've been asked to screen it in Australia. Um, why? Why do you think uh, people in these other countries uh, are interested? They don't have the same uh, exact racial history that, that we do, although they certainly have uh, racial issues. Um, so what do you think about that? Uh, why they're interested and in, in what they get out of it? I, I found that, um... It's really unfortunate, but um, anti-Black uh, racism is global. <laughs> so uh, a lot of the experiences um, that we have here um, are also experiences that um, you know Black law students and lawyers share um, in other countries. So um, the interesting and also the really 
cool thing is that, you know, now we're at a point where um, a lot of people are doing work. You know, when, when I was in law school, there was no such thing as uh, DEI and diversity, equity, inclusion, all of that. But now globally, that's a thing now. People are really wrestling and grappling with these issues globally. So um, I, I was surprised when I, when I received those invitations, but um, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. I think that we should have these uh, conversations um, globally. I think this is not just an American issue. This is a universal, this is a global issue and that um, it's a human rights issue. It's something that we should all uh, come together and figure out how we can find solutions together. So I was surprised initially, but I think, I think it's, it's, it's a great thing where we can get together and compare and contrast our experiences and work together to figure out solutions because this is, this is, these are issues we're gonna be you know, dealing with and grappling with for years to come. The American Bar Association uh, has uh, a new standard that requires cultural competency anti-bias and racism training. How could your uh, film be used uh, in this, since there's this new requirement? And what do you think about that, that they just passed this standard? Yeah, just last week um, is my understanding. I think that that's, um, you know, I don't, I don't even know what to say. I remember when I was in law school, um, the things that were happening, it was kind of like an out of body experience. I, I could not make any sense of it. And um, I used to work for, um, for Dean Hines in my second year and I would go in several occasions and talk to him about the fact that we needed to do something. And um, it just shows you the progress that we've made because at that time he said that there was nothing that they could do unless it was a faculty member um, that did something or said something to black students that there was nothing that could be done. Um, you know, at that time, you know, there was nothing that they could really say um, to stop kind of the, the, the kind of now, now there's a vocabulary. So when, when I was in school, there was no vocabulary, there's no microaggressions and bias and all of that, all of that vocabulary that's come what within the last 10, 20 years. So there wasn't vocabulary for it. There wasn't a, a DEI consultant or strategist that you can bring in. None of that existed. So I mentioned to him that we have to do training. We have to do something in a law school. You know, the things that I'm experiencing and my classmates are experiencing just doesn't make sense. And so uh, he at that time told me that you need to do something about it. Like you're a student, why don't you create the training? And I remember being a second year student at that time, 22, 23 years old, thinking I'm, you know, I'm a law student too. I don't, I don't, I've never dealt with any of this before. I don't have the expertise or, you know, I don't know what to do. And I went talking to people trying to figure it out. So long story short, you know, full circle now. And many years later, finally, um, you know, I, I, I embrace the fact that the American Bar Association has taken this leadership and requiring and mandating it. I think that is critically important. I think lawyers serve a very important and special role. And um, I do think that um, a part of advancing justice and fairness is you know, that cult cultural competency, anti-bias training, the, the anti-racism training, I think it's important. So I'm all for that. And I'm, I'm sorry it took that long, but I, I embrace the fact that they're, they did take the leadership to require it. And I'm hoping that you know more of the deans um, and professors embrace that and also take leadership and and, and show courage and um, you know making strides to carry it further. So with the film, I think the film can serve a role in inciting discussion. Um, not everybody's going to have the same experience. I have a laundry list of experiences that I had in my law school years, which were very different. I could relate to what the student, the lawyers, and the film discussed. But I think that the film is important in inciting discussion. People can compare, contrast, talk about things that can be done differently. But I think that's an important way that art can be used. Films can be used as you know, a tool to teach and incite discussion. So I, 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 I do think that this is a very tangible and important contribution. Um, and I think it, it's come right on time, right on the heels of this. So I think, I think it, it's gonna be a great contribution to that training and that requirement. 
Uh, I, I think you'll be glad to know that after the George Floyd uh, incident happened, uh, that the University of Iowa College of Law, like many institutions, decided to take some action. And so uh, we created a committee, an ad hoc committee, which I chaired to look at the entire institution. We did a 22 page report and we have been implementing that report and uh, we already had a DEI committee that has faculty, students, and staff. And we also have a separate DEI faculty committee. And we have been doing sessions with the faculty, for faculty, about some of these issues. And also, of course, this event is one of those co-sponsored by the larger DEI committee. And so uh, even though I'm the only instructor at the College of Law at this moment who's teaching, uh, I teach critical race theory, uh, and I've taught race, racism in American law. I'm the only one doing those particular courses. Uh, we are uh, committed to you know, expanding the curriculum, expanding the programming, uh, et cetera, uh, which uh, is very different than, than when uh, you, you were in school. Um, a question has come up, uh, where can they see this film uh, again, uh, this event that we're doing, this webinar is going to be posted on the UICHR website, but we cannot put up the film. Uh, so it'll be the event without the film. So you can you tell people if they, you know, they want to see it again or they didn't catch it, how would they uh, access it? Sure. Well, the film is still on the film festival circuit and we're still doing private screenings, so it's not widely available yet. But if you want to keep up uh, with where it'll be screened and when until it is widely available, you can go to the website, which is becomingblacklawyers.com. And so there, it, you know, we list all the screenings, where it's going to where it's available and also um, when it's available, um, you know, I guess publicly for like video on demand and all that, we'll have that um, on the site once it does become available, which I hope will be um, by the summer. That, that's my hope. Well, our time has gone by so quickly and it's a real shame because uh, you know we would love to talk much longer about the film and of course about all your other endeavors. I've been proud to participate in most of the annual National Black Pre-Law Conferences and they've gone on even when you've, you've gone virtual, uh, but we, we have to close this session. So I'd like to thank our alum, uh, Evangeline Mitchell, of whom we are very proud. You are in the finest tradition of the College of Law and we know you're gonna to continue to do fabulous things in the future. Uh, I'd like to also thank today's sponsors and UICHR's tech guru, who is Erica Christensen for all of her efforts. Uh, as I said, this event has been taped and it will be on the UICHR website. There'll be like a, a blank uh, for a minute <laughs> showing where the film goes, but the rest of it will be up. And that website is uichr.uiowa.edu. And our entire webinar collection is up on our website. UICHR has more great programming in store for you uh, this semester for our, our viewers. On March 9th, we are going to do a panel on the, the war crisis in Ukraine. Uh, as you know, that's just uh, cutting edge and we have to speak out and we have a distinguished panel there. And then on March 30th uh, at noon, we are going to continue our series on climate change and human rights. It'll be the second uh, episode and that topic is human rights and climate change, intergenerational rights and duties. Finally, please consider a tax deductible contribution to UICHR if you'd like on our website. This has been a wonderful experience. Uh, thank everyone. We hope that you will have a wonderful afternoon.